Hi everyone, Bonnie Violet here, a queer chaplain. And in case you don't know where you are, you are at Dragon Spirituality. This is actually Faith, Hope and Justice, um, Drag Spirituality and Trans Spirit series in collaboration with Glide Memorial Church and the Glide Pride team. Um, this is actually our sixth episode and final episode of the series. Um, I'm really excited for our guest this evening. Before we get go there, I would just give you a little bit more of a landscape, if you will. Um, this is a space in which is kind of like a drag show meets a spiritual conversation. So you're welcome to tip uh, Honey along the way. Um, you'll see her Venmo as well as like Facebook, Instagram along the way. So feel free to connect with her and support her in that way as well, as well along, along throughout the show. Um, also feel free to ask questions. Um, I'll do my best to, we'll, we'll do our best to respond to every question that comes in tonight. Um, and also take a moment and uh, if you can share, thank you, Perry. Thanks for saying I look amazing tonight. <laughs> um, uh, also um, take a moment and share this stream to your friends or on your socials um, so we can bring more folks into the conversation who can hear about our amazing guest this evening. And I think that's all I needed to kind of get out for now. So I'll introduce our guests. So um, activist, politico and drag queen, Honey Mahogany is a San Francisco native and a social worker by training who received her master's in social wel welfare from UC Berkeley. Currently serving as the third vice chair of the San Francisco Democratic Party, Honey is also co-founder of the Transgender Cultural District, a co-owner of the stud bar and currently works as a legislative aide in San Francisco. Honey's work has earned her recognition from city of San Francisco and the state of California, sainthood from the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and awards from Har Harvey Milk Club, SF Young Democrats, uh, SF Women's Political Committee and the Women's Foundation of California. MX, MX uh, Mahogany has been featured in the Stonewall 50 Queerty's list of advocates continuing the legacy of Stonewall and appeared twice in Out Magazine's Out 100, a yearly list of the 100 most impactful and influential LGBTQ people in the world. And here everyone is Honey Mahogany. Hello. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, how are you? Good, good, good. Super busy season, huh, with Pride? Oh my God, not just Pride, girl. It is Pride, <laughs> but on top of that, it is the budget season for the city of San Francisco. Mm. So we are in hearings all day and um, it is also fundraising season for the San Francisco Democratic Party. So there's just been a little too, oh, it's also my partner's birthday, our anniversary. Oh, congratulations. Um, so there's, thank you. There's just so much going on this month. June is a, it's the solstice, happy solstice. Right, right, No, no time for sleep. No time for sleep, no time for, no rest for the wicked. <laughs> right, right. Well, I really appreciate you um, coming on the show this evening. Um, I usually like to start um, by hearing a little bit about people's childhood. Um, and you can feel free just to share what you like, talking about what it was like being a child and maybe how spirituality or even drag was a part of that, if it was. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, you look stunning tonight. Or oh, thank yeah, you. it is night, right? It's still bright out, but it's. Uh, <laughs> I know. Um, right? Yeah, you look stunning. Um, I grew up here in San Francisco, and um, my parents are from Ethiopia. They came here as political uh, political asylees, um, and uh, you know, I grew up in a very Christian household, and Ethiopia has a very uh, long history of Christianity, uh, which predates actually Europe. Um, so, you know, Orthodox Christian, my dad's parents, my dad's family is Orthodox Christian. My mom's family is actually Catholic mm -hmm. and um, grew up with, I guess, a very, um, I guess, within a very religious household, went to church every Sunday, went to Catholic school, K through 12, um, was, you know, God and faith were very much a part of everyday life. Um, and I, you know, I felt found comfort in that. I mean, I think that there was obviously a little bit of discomfort because 
you know, I had these inclinations and feelings that I knew were at odds with the teachings of my church and the things that I was hearing both at home and at school and, you know, again, in the church. And so that part was tricky, but I think the thing that I really took away from it um, and the thing that I think was most ingrained with me was a sense of, you know, being a person for others and, um, you know, treating others as we want to be treated and, you know, that we are in fact our, our brothers and sisters keepers. And um, that is, I think, you know, this message of love and, and uh, justice and kindness, I think is really what kind of came through all of that. And, and it also, I think, worked along the, along the lines of, you know, the environment in which I grew up in, you know, growing up in San Francisco and being a part of this incredibly diverse city where there were so many immigrants and being, um, you know, from a family of immigrants myself in a neighborhood that was very much, um, you know, the, there were a lot of immigrants in, in, the, in the sunset where I grew up, um, specifically from, you know, AAPI communities. Mm -hmm. And so just really valuing that diversity, whether it came to race or religion and, you know, eventually like sexual orientation and gender identity um, was key, I think, for me growing up. And um, that also played into the spirituality because, you know, you know, one of the things that we learn in the church is that you're not supposed to judge others and, you know, mm -hmm. nobody's, nobody's perfect. And so, you know, you know, um, let he without or she without sin cast the first stone. So right. um, I think that a lot of my, I think, drive for social justice and understanding of the world did actually come from those early religious teachings. And I kind of, you know, it in fact made me really question some of the other teachings like homophobia and misogyny that I think are ingrained in a lot of, um, the Abrahamic religions, I, I guess I can say for sure, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that those those parts of the teachings were sort of at odds with these other sort of more like all encompassing teachings of, you know, God is love and, you know, don't judge others and, um, and, and that, you know, we're all brothers and sisters in this, in this fight, in this life. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was mm -hmm. kind of, that's kind of a, a, a rough overall sort of that's picture of my childhood upbringing within the, the church. Oh, that's fantastic. You covered a lot of a lot of bases. Thanks so much for that. And so at some point in time, you know, it sounded like there was maybe some conflict with um, the religion that you grew up with. Did you end up needing to leave or did you just? I guess I was like in college and, you know, I was, again, very sort of in it. I was, you know, an, an altar boy back in the day and um, you know, even when I went to college and I went out of town for college, I was still really involved in like our campus ministry center mm -hmm. and um, did a lot of interfaith stuff between um, actually the, the Catholic Center and the, um, the Shalom Center, which was um, sort of where they had like a, a synagogue and like a Jewish community. We actually worked a lot together and did um, interfaith um, events and had dialogues and, and worked together on, 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 on things. Um, and so spirituality remained a part of my life. I mean, mm -hmm. even in college, but I think it was, you know, I think there was a lot of pushback specifically when, um, gosh, Cardinal Ratzinger became Pope, Pope Benedict. Um, and there was a lot of sort of like, well, there were the cover-ups around um, the child sex abuse scandals. Mm -hmm. And then there were also, um, there was also this like really, I think homophobic um, rhetoric coming out from the head of the church um, and many people high up in the church and sort of scapegoating homosexuality um, and equating that with, with, with child sex abuse when it was, when, you know, it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't, you know, the, the two aren't necessarily connected, right? We know that. Right, right. Um, and so I just found myself being really disgusted by that and, you know, kind of, Pushing away from my pushing myself away from the church as an institution that's really fallible, specifically the Catholic Church, um, and you know, really sort of turned inward and kind of figured out ways in which I didn't need the church mm -hmm. um, and was able to sort of pursue my spirituality and be more open and try different things and you know, um, be have a more sort of generalized faith and spirituality versus a religion. Yeah. Um, and you know, and and I and I don't at all. I don't think I 
knock religion at all. I think that religion is super important for many people. And, you know, I find myself sometimes missing it and really enjoying being in services when I am in services, um, whether it be of, you know, Catholic services or, you know, a service at Glide or, or mm -hmm. somewhere else. Um, really missing that sort of sense of community and and music. Music was a big part of it for me too. Um, but I'm not as connected as I used to be. Um, mm -hmm. I do think about if I become a parent at some point, you know, would I want to be more engaged in a spiritual practice just to pass on some of that to my potential children? Right. Um, and even just to like, be more involved in a community because I mean, not that I need to be more involved in right. more things, but um, <laughs> but I do think that there is, you know, as I think that religion and and and, and churches are are really in, uh, big ways in which people develop uh, meaningful ties to community, mm -hmm. especially um, uh, for folks who maybe otherwise feel marginalized. And so, um, yeah, there's a part of me that misses it or maybe thinks about you know ways in which I could bring that back into my life again, but. Um, I have distanced myself a bit over the yeah. years. Community is so is so important. And it seems like it's, I mean, I think a lot of queer folks, we end up kind of, you know, we end up kind of finding our own churches and our own community in places that might not be temples. You know, they might be bars and clubs or, you know, wherever else we can, uh, I guess, hang out and, and you know, like just, I, don't, I think lift each other's spirits. You know, that's why I started to do this, uh, Thing back in 2014, before I ever even did drag, I saw drag queens as kind of the spiritual leaders of our community because they're the ones that are visible. They're the ones that are taking all the heat. They're the ones that are bringing joy. They're raising money. They're, you know what I mean? I, to me, that's what like church, that's what church is all about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the bars definitely became my church for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think that that is a, a queer tradition, as you said, you know, I think that um, when queer people were very much uh, reject, queer trans, uh, you know, were very much rejected from not just their families, but their churches and their communities, they had to rebuild those communities in the only place that was where they, where they could be themselves, which was at the bar behind closed doors, mm -hmm. where they were amongst others like themselves and could, again, like as a, as a community that was, you know, oppressed and, you know, sort of shunned, um, being able to connect with folks who are like you and build community that way was incredibly powerful and meaningful and still is to this day. I mean, so many yeah. people still come to the U.S. and to San Francisco in particular, you know, freeing persecution, you know, hoping to be able to find themselves and be themselves. And 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 many of the way the, the way in which many of those folks first connect with people is still at a bar. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, bars are, I think, incredibly important places specifically to the LGBT community and, and definitely hold a lot of power and in, in spirituality. And I think that also leads to, you know, what we're, we're talking about, which is drag, because I think that drag um, within those spaces does take on a spiritual power that is very tangible, I think, for people and inspiring. And, you know, people are uplifted by it. And, um, and, and I think it, it's 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 like a, a good sermon. It delivers a message. Um, it's inspiring. It's um, uh, entertaining, um, and it brings people together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when did when did drag come into your life? Uh, I first did drag for a friend's film. Um, you know, uh, it was for it was in college. I think it was my sophomore year. And my friend Rue Sommer um, was in the film program at, at uh, my undergrad at U the University of Southern California. And, you know, he was like, oh, I think you're, you know, I want you to do this role for me um, because I think you're the only guy that I know that would look good as a girl. And so um, I did it and it was super fun. And I got to wear like, you know, my roommate at the time's clothes and it was super basic. But, you know, looking back on that film actually, I don't know, like it was very unclear on whether that person, that character was a drag queen or trans. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they were more trans. And so for me, it was also just very like, uh, what's the word? I guess um, a, a prescient moment. Um, it was, you know, kind of, uh, what, what's that? What's I'm looking for a certain word, but basically I think it was, it was 
showing me a little piece of my future. It was just mm, like a little yeah. sneak peek. Um, and I, yeah, so that was my intro. And then I did drag a couple more times in college. And that's actually how I ended up coming out to my family, um, mm. which, which again was also part of the script of that first film. So again, like very- um, And coming out as? As, as a, well, as queer first. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my, my family found out because, you know, I had a, some sort of like Flickster account or something. And I had pictures in there of me dressed in drag amongst other pictures. And one of my cousins ended up forwarding it to members of my family. And so mm -hmm. that's how I was, I wouldn't come out, I was outed. Oh, yeah. But um, it, yeah, I just, I think it kind of happened in a way that was just sort of poetic. <laughs> I mean, it was definitely traumatic at the time and, and, and uh, you know, but also like, I think kind of powerful and, um, you know, I, w I survived it and I think I learned a lot from it. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, as, as much, much in life, like sometimes I think we learn our, our, our best lessons from some of our darkest and hardest moments. So that definitely was the case there. Right. How, how do you feel that um, drag had um, impacted your, I guess, journey of understanding your gender? Well, um, again, like, you know, things sort of like looking at, you know, foretelling the future. Um, when I first started doing drag, I think people were just like, first of all, this was way before RuPaul's Drag Race. So there was no like, there was no like, drag aesthetic that was sort of established that people like looked to, to be like, this is the definition of drag. Um, and specifically in San Francisco, people were doing all sorts of different types of drag and very little pre what we call pretty drag. Um, and so, uh, you know, I grew up in Soma seeing things like, you know, um, you know, going to the stud and going to, you know, a bar called Truck, which no, is no longer there now. And just seeing very like, what I would call, I guess, like sort of <laughs> typical Soma gutter drag. Mm -hmm. It was very ramshackles and um, all about sort of like, you know, creating a scene and being messy and being funny and fun. And um, and I, w I came in and I think I was just, you know, very pretty and sort of like, uh, very looking looking less like a drag queen and more like a trans person perhaps mm -hmm. and i remember being you know backstage at one thing and i was telling someone you know that i was they were asking about you know where i was living and i was like well you know i'm i'm in transition and i'm you know kind of going between you know moving i was at grad school in berkeley at the time or leaving grad school and i was coming back to San Francisco, moving back to San Francisco. But they, I later on found out that they, they, they thought that I had said, that I meant that I was transitioning mm. and that I was, you know, um, on hormones. And then, so the next time I came to the show, I just remember people being like, oh, like, congratulations. And I was like, for what? Um, <laughs> right. um, and then there were, you know, other people, like, I don't know if folks know Jupiter Knows, who's just like, I think such a goddess and such a, you know, wonderful spirit. Um, who always used to come up to me and tell me like, you know, girl, are you pickling? Um, <laughs> and I was just like, what, what does that even mean? And she's like, you know, pickling, are you on the juice? And I was like, mm. I, I know, you know, I don't do drugs. And she was like, no, 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 I mean the hormones. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, I, and I was like, oh, no. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there were all these moments in my life, her and, you know, gosh, a couple of other just like, elders in the community who are just always like, oh, you know, have you ever thought about it? You know, I think right. that, that might work for you. And I, and, I, and I hadn't, but then, you know, I just, I reached a point in my life where I was like, oh, like, I guess this is true for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think it's because, I don't know, it might have, it might have happened without drag, but I, I definitely think drag made it easier in a, a variety of ways. Yeah, um, yeah. I got to play around with it more, you know, in a, in a, in a way that was sort of like, out in the open and I got to learn a lot from other queens and trans women and be around other queens and trans women and people who were in between. And um, gosh, just so many little moments of like figuring out when other drag queens were realizing that they were trans. Mm -hmm. um, like I, gosh, there was one moment I remember when um, I was backstage at the stud and I won't say who this was, but it was uh, a person who was sort of uh, someone in the nightlife scene who 
was, you know, a drag queen and, you know, eventually um, ended up coming out as trans many, many years later, maybe like a decade later. Um, but when I saw her that night, um, it was it was the first time I had met her. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw her in the corner and I remember saying like, you know, she's she started talking to me and I was like, oh, I thought you were um, a girl at first. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of those awkward things that people say before we knew how to talk about gender or anything right. like that. Um, and, sh and she was like, well, I am. Um, mm -hmm. And, but, you know, again, like, she was not actually out as trans at that time. Mm -hmm. I think it was just like, you know, it was like a subconscious moment. And I think that oftentimes in those environments, you know, where maybe our guard is down in a certain way, where we have community members where we feel safe, you know, we can have moments where, we're, where we have those realizations and where we were like, oh, well, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really relate to a lot of that. When I first started doing drag too, I felt like I was obviously experiencing drag, I think a little differently than most of the girls around me. You know, like, I don't know, I just felt like I, I just felt so connected to it. And I also had people that were like, hey, uh, you know, if you wanted to soften up a little bit you know, when I was a bearded lady. <laughs> um, but we do have a question from Perry. Perry asks, where in your spiritual practice have you found space for healing? Where have I found space for healing? Gosh, I, you know, I could probably use some space for healing. <laughs> I'm not very good at making space. I mean, I, I know that's, not, you know, it's not funny, but I, I'm one of, I just, I don't know that I ever, I don't oftentimes take time to stop. And I don't know that I find, when I do, I don't know that I find that in spirituality. I mean, again, like some of it, like when I go to mass, when I have gone to mass for various things or been in spiritual spaces, like it is a little bit like riding a bike and you, go, you can kind of like hop back into it. Um, but it's not something that I seek out. I will say that I guess I have like, in many points in my life, like I've had conversations with the universe, um, which I, you know, feel like are spiritual moments for me when I'm looking for direction. And I, the universe talks back all the time. Right. Um, I remember the, you know, right around my Saturn's return, just sort of like being done with, or just, you know, I, I was done with grad school and I was working full time, but I was also doing drag a lot. I was doing drag like five times a week or something like that. And it was exhausting, but I loved it. Um, and I needed to figure out what to, what direction my life was going to take me. And I remember just having a being open to the universe and being like, "Okay, well, you know, should I be per performing? Should I be doing social work? You know, give me some sort of direction here. Like, I need to figure out like where I need to be investing more time." And I kid you not, within like I think within like two to three weeks, I was reached out to by producers from RuPaul's Drag Race, mm -hmm. producers from America's Got Talent, and producers from the uh, X Factor, and and made it onto two of those shows. So like, it, it kind of like, yeah. So I've had moments like that where I, um, where I think that, you know, have that have helped sort of guide me. I don't know that it was necessarily healing, but it definitely like directed me in a certain, it, it took me to a certain place. I mean, even when I was like double eliminated on RuPaul's Drag Race, I remember being on that stage and kind of praying and being like universe, God, goddess, whomever, like, you know, if this is what I'm supposed to do, then let me continue. But if there's other better things for me, like I am kind of just sort of like open myself, right. like leave it up to you. Like I, you know, you, you know best, so show me the way. And then I was double eliminated. So um, <laughs> it, was right. very, it was a very clear answer. Um, and, um, you know, it's not always something that I think you're, you're wanting necessarily, but I think if you're open to it, you know, like I think it can, can definitely take you places and that it has for me, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I, I look at where my life is now and I, I think that I'm, I'm much happier doing what I am now, even as exhausted as I am, even as crazy as things have gotten for me, um, than I would have been if I, you know, had really continued to pursue the RuPaul's Drag Race um, track. Mm -hmm. Would you would you say that your work is helps you with your healing process? Yeah, I mean, I think my work is incredibly rewarding. I mean, it's so hard and difficult, but I think most things that are rewarding are, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Um, like being a parent, like being a parent is not easy, but I think most people would say that it's rewarding. Um, I, I, yeah. And so I, I find a lot of joy in my work, in my ability to connect with, you know, not just my community, but many communities that are, you know, in fact, a part of my community in one way or another. Um, I, uh, I find that, I do find that healing and in, in figuring out that most people, most of us have more in common than, you know, not. And that, you know, many of us have the same goals, even if we think we we, we may have different, you know, routes to get there. And um, that part has been healing. Although there's been a lot of toxicity in there too. So it, it is a little bit, you, you know, you got to take the good with the bad sometimes. Mm -hmm. Can't throw the baby out with the bath water. Um, so yeah, I think, I think what I have found most healing most recently is really sort of like taking time to reconnect with nature. I feel like that's a very millennial thing to say, but, um, and not even millennial, but like, you know, a very human thing to say um, in that, like, I really enjoy my little patio garden and I, you know, dream about being able to escape to the countryside and have a cabin in the woods with, you know, a little cottage garden or something that I can tend to. It's like my ideal retirement scenario and somehow also like be close enough where I could come to the city and still be with my, my friends and family. Yeah. I'm going to, we're going to, I'm going to play like a little 30 second clip, take a little break and then we'll be right back. Okay. And we're back. <laughs> Folks, if you have questions, um, please do put them uh, in the comments now. Now is a really great time to, to ask questions. Um, I, I have to admit, I didn't like, I didn't realize how much you've like done and accomplished. I didn't, I didn't realize you were a singer for some reason. I enjoyed listening to a lot of your music and you know, there are a lot of different facets of yourself. Um, is it, what are you like, what are the things do you think that you're most proud of or um, I guess that would be, well, I mean, it's, I would say that I'm most proud of the trans district for sure. I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. the, you know, I was, I talk about this with Ari all the time. I'm like, well, that was pretty cool. Like, are we ever going to do anything this cool ever again? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you know, it's not every day you help found a district, um, but it, you know, and I, I, I say that, you know, it was many of us who did it. And like, it was, you know, definitely a community driven initiative and, but it was, it's so powerful. And I think, you know, under Aria's leadership specifically has grown so much and, um, you know, I think is growing into our wildest dreams or what we had dreamed it would be. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely the proudest thing that I've done, you know, um, and hopefully it will be a lasting um, have a lasting impact on not just our community, but you know the city of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And do you do you still do a lot of drag now? Uh, do I still do a lot of yeah. drag now? Occasionally, it's very rare um, these days. Although I've done it a couple times already this month because Pride, but um, it. Yeah, I not as much. I mean, you know, at the height of it, I was doing drag probably three, four, or five days a week, um, and then now I just I don't have the time. I I I, I think I I may actually end up hosting RuPaul's Drag Race viewing parties um, starting this Thursday. We're gonna nice. give it a trial run at the Lookout and then see how that goes and if I can can manage it. I may end up making it a fundraiser for the San Francisco Democratic Party because that is um, something that I need to be doing all the time. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, I'm finding ways to incorporate it into the stuff that I do when I can. Fantastic. Um, and you recently were um, voted, vote, like you were recently, you recently, why am I messing up with my words? <laughs> it happens sometimes when you're talking for a while, you know, it's just like, 
I know, right? But you you recently were um, elected to a position with the Democratic Party, correct? Yes. So I am. So in my bio, my bio needs to be updated because, well, I think when I sent it over, I was still third vice chair, but I'm now yeah. chair chair of the San Francisco Democratic Party, um, which uh, was an internal vote. But um, you know, we were all elected to our seats by the public in March. Um, mm -hmm. The Democratic Party. Um, yeah, it's made up of representatives that the public votes on. And then it also includes, you know, what we call ex officios or people who are elected to sort of statewide or or um, or, 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 off, or federal office. Um, so people like, you know, Scott Wiener, David Chu, Phil Ting, Nancy Pelosi, um, Diane Feinstein, the Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis, um, Jackie Spear, many other folk. Uh, I think those are all the ex officios. Um, so them and then all the folks that were elected by the people of San Francisco um, specifically to this seat. And then they all vote on who their chair is. And so I was elected as chair. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and it was an, another first, yes? Yes, first black person for the, uh, to be chair of the San Francisco Democratic Party and first uh, trans person in the country to be appointed or to, to be chair of a Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, you 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 uh, participate in a lot of firsts. It's really fantastic. You know, um, <laughs> I, I you know it's funny because I know a lot of trans people don't talk about their their birth names, but um, my parents named me Alpha, so I just feel like that there's mm. a there's a lot of I don't know just juju or whatever you want to call it. But um, um, no, I'm very proud to be able to um, to fill that role. I think it's uh, you know I definitely am building on the work that has been done by generations of people before me. And okay. we are at a moment in history, I think, and a moment in, in this country's history where, you know, we are ready, I think, to have trans people take the lead and take leadership and, you know, have a greater understanding of gender and gender identity and intersectionality and all of those things and race. And, um, and so, you know, I'm proud of the work that we have all done um, so that I can continue to do this. Yeah, uh, Perry has a question. Uh, what advice would you give to young activists? What advice would I give to young activists? Um, I, you know, I mean, I, there's so much. I mean, I think it, it, it kind of, I'm like trying to figure out what exactly I would say. I mean, I think, you know, just keep going is the most important thing because I think that, you know, um, but also take time for yourself. This is the advice that I should give to myself because I never take it, but like, um, I think I admire those folks who and and try to prom make promises to myself to take more time for myself and take time to recharge and um, so that you can continue doing the work because the work can be exhausting sometimes and you know is oftentimes thankless mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's what I would say um, is you know try and take time for yourself but also you know I think just keep going because it's not always easy. I forget who's, you know, there, there's that saying that like um, progress is made, uh, progress isn't isn't like a, a smooth or, you know, straight road. It's, it's sort of like um, flipping over like a brick, you know, oh, like, right. it, like you kind of make, you kind of advance in like these sort of like weird shapes, we, <laughs> weird sort of like slow, you know, you like all of a sudden you sort of hop forward and then you you don't move for a while and you hop forward. Um, it And so, yeah, it's just a lot of labor. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I just, you know, I think people just need to remember that, you know, change will eventually happen. I think that putting that positive energy out there um, uh, consistently believing in your movement, you know, and, and bringing people into the movement, I think, uh, you know, takes time and energy and, but it, it, in the end it's, it's worth it. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that the, the universe does for us too, is it gives us opportunities to tell people what we need to hear. I know I often <laughs> find myself telling people and I'm like, oh girl, you, you probably could, you could probably do that yourself, you know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and so what's, what's next for you? Well, who know? I mean, you know, I, I currently work in the District 6 office of Supervisor Matt Haney. I would, you know, love the opportunity to be able to run for the District 6 seat. I mean, I, you know, I feel like we've been able to do such great work um, while here, especially in the Tenderloin, but also in, in Soma and Treasure Island and, you know, other parts of District 6. And I, 
um, I would love to be able to see that work continue. Um, mm -hmm. So that is something that I have thought about a lot. And I, you know, I, I am at this point talking publicly about my intention to run when, when Matt is done with uh, he, here serving as supervisor. Um, but I'm not sure exactly when that will be. You know, he could potentially be there for another five years. So it might be a right. while and things might change. And, and politics wasn't something you initially like set out to do, is that correct? No, I did not want to be in politics. Um, well, it's, I shouldn't say that. I, I never thought about being in politics. Um, it wasn't something that I grew up thinking that I wanted to be, you know, mayor or president or anything like that. Um, but I find it to be a, an effective means to an end. I mean, I got involved, you know, I'm a trained, trained as a social worker. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the work that I've done has been really about trying to be that person of others, you know, going back to sort of that like childhood, you know, um, teachings and, and values that I've carried forward um, in helping my community. Um, and I found that a really effective way to do that is to build relationships with local government and, you know, be politically active and involved and help shape policy. And well, it, 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 it started with, you know, building relationships with your local government officials and then, you know, um, helping educate people on, on what to vote for so that we can create positive change. And then it was like, okay, well then how do we write, you know, even better initiatives and, you know, and then how do we get people elected and how do we, and then it became, you know, then before you know it, you're like involved in politics. And then before you know it, you're, you know, running yourself because, you know, I, I do believe in being the change you want to see in the world. And so yeah. I, I think it's a, I think also, you know, for me, it's, it's, there's been a tremendous amount of Gosh, I, I guess for me, I, I feel like I have a, a duty because I feel like there's, you know, been given certain advantages and, you know, privileges or, you know, worked hard to get, you know, all of these things. I think all of us have privilege, right? Mm -hmm. In different ways. Um, you know, certain people have more, certain people have different kinds, but we all have skills that we bring to the table that, you know, we can use to lev and, and, and I think have a duty to leverage. And so for myself, you know, I've been given this platform and, you know, I, you know, been given this, was able to get an education and do all these different things. And so if I can bring all of these experiences and all this education and all of these things together um, to create change, then, you know, I, I, I want to do that. And so that's why I continue to sort of pursue this and run for office and, and do these things. Um, and I'll continue to do them as, as long as I feel like I can be useful. You know, I may mm -hmm. come to a point where I'm just like, I don't know, I, do, I feel like, you know, I don't know the, how much more useful I can be to the movement or to, you know, or I'm tired and need to take a break. Um, but right now I, you know, I'm gonna take advantage of um, all the opportunities I have right now to, to do that. Yeah, I think oftentimes community folks, you know, politics kind of choose, chooses you. You know what I mean? It just kind of, like you said, it kind of becomes part of a responsibility once you get a certain amount of visibility or you get seen in a certain way, it just kind of naturally comes, especially like if you're in a, a marginalized group of people or whatever, you know, I think it's, you know, it just kind of calls us to, to, to do it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And would you call that spiritual? I mean, I guess you could, uh, you know, it all to me is just, I think that there is a spiritual thread to it for sure. I mean, you know, when you talk about being called. Mm -hmm. um, well, it seems like it's I a value think, to you. Like it's, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, is it a value that you hold to give back or to? Yes. Give? I mean, for me, for me, yeah. For me, it's about giving back and being able to, and, and also like, yeah, all the things I talked about, you know, using again, mm -hmm. like what privileges I've been afforded and what, what, you know, achievements I have to sort of leverage those to create change and to, um, yeah, uh, again, be a person for others. And um, all of those things, I think, have led me to this place. And so some of that is based on spirituality, um, for sure. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for, um, is, there, is there anything else you would like to share with us this evening that you didn't get a chance to? Um, well, I hope everyone has a happy pride. Um, I yes. don't know what people's pride plans are, but I am gonna be, um, hosting on Pride Sunday at uh, the Stern Grove Festival. 
Um, and so I'm super excited by, for that. Um, I think Perfume Genius, Madame Gandhi, and there are other performers as well. I might, I'm gonna perform, I think, too. So I'm um, excited for that. Um, but you know, regardless of what you do, whether you're going to Juanita Moore's Pride Party, which I know is also a very popular one and raises, mm -hmm. you know, she's raised over a million dollars for charity through that party. And um, there's just so many events going on. I just hope that everyone is able to be safe and celebrate finally now that as we're exiting this pandemic um, and be able to share in community together. So, um, you know, have fun. Yes, indeed. Well, I, I just want to say thank you for um, joining us this evening and everything that you do in the community. Um, and so, yeah, so thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I think that's it. I don't know. I feel like there's more to say, but I'm, I'm just not, I'm not in it tonight. I'm not for whatever reason. I apologize. Um, but um, thanks everyone for joining joining us this evening. As I said, this was the final episode of the series. If you're curious to watch um, the previous interviews with folks, um, you can just check out the links in the description. Um, if you're listening to us on a podcast, you can also find those in the links in the description as well. So take care, have a great pride and bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone.